today I want to know, you know, what it is that the Lord asks of me. And today what I want to do is have a look at David's life and some other things as well. The Bible Society, it says the Bible and the World War I. There were a number of people, okay, that, that came to faith or through their faith endured the war. But what was amazing is, if I can find it, 65 million men were mobilized across Europe during World War I. And nearly a third of them, 21 million, were wounded. Another 8.5 million were killed. And 7.7 .7 million were taken as prisoners of war. That means that over half of all our soldiers that went to the war were killed, wounded, or captured. It was clearly vital that each man could read the Bible to search for comfort, understanding, or simply a link with home. So every one of the 5.7 million British soldiers, sailors, and airmen who joined up were given a copy of the New Testament with the rest of their kit. Did you know that? This is a story of um, Private Frank Viner. His father had given to him less than three months previously for his birthday a Bible. Neither of them could have known that the book would save Frank's life. His daughter, Grace Cross, who's now 80, from Leatherhead in Surrey, describes Frank as jovial, thoughtful, and happy, always keen to help others. She takes up the story. He always kept the Bible in his right-hand breast pocket, she says. They were in the trenches at the Somme, and for some reason, he moved the Bible into his left-hand pocket. Then he heard the words from Psalm 91 go through his mind. They say, a thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but you will not be harmed. Then there was an enormous blast as a shell hit the trench. His comrades were killed all around him. Frank was thrown to the ground by the shell's impact. His uniform torn. His helmet blown off. And he too would have been dead had it not been for his Bible. A huge piece of shrapnel was embedded in it, ripping it, from, ripping it open from cover to cover, says Grace. If he hadn't moved it to his left-hand pocket, he would have been killed, she adds. My father always said that his Bible had saved his life, says Grace. He felt that God was protecting him. It was an extraordinary experience. It was to have a lasting impact. Shell shock from the incident took Frank first to hospital and then away from the front line for the rest of the war. Grace believes the incident also led to her father having two nervous breakdowns in later life, but it also confirmed him in his faith. She, he, she said, there wasn't a Sunday that he didn't go to church twice, she said. He would have gone into the ministry and spent a year training at Bible College after the war. But in the end, he went into the family's bakery business. But he always preached as a lay minister about his experiences in the war. Hallelujah. Alfred Algar. Alfred Algar was a member of the Suffolk Regiment when war broke out. He was among the first to be sent to war. 
On the 5th of August 1914, the day after hostilities were announced, just three weeks later, the Germans captured him. He was held for more than four years, making him one of the longest held prisoners of war to survive World War I. There were tre tre terrible uh, pervasions in the prison camp in Dobotitz, says his granddaughter, Barbara Burns, who's now 70. In 1915, a postcard of a group of the prisoners, including Alfred, smartly dressed and looking well-fed, was produced. It was sent to family members, including Alfred's brother, Robert, for his birthday. But this early PR stunt belied the facts, says Barbara. He wouldn't talk about it after the war, she recalls. He was very badly beaten. He still had the scars on his back when I was a child. He saw horrific things happen to other prisoners. They crucified people, she says. Barbara remembers her grandfather, who went on to test drive tanks at Woolwich Barracks as a broken down little old man. His health was very badly affected by the war. She says of the man who spent nearly six months recuperating after the amnesties, who returned home in May 1919, nearly five years after going to war and being captured. During all this time, Alfred carried his New Testament with him. Poignantly, it falls open at Matthew 24, 6, which reads, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. His New Testament is my most treasured possession, says Barbara. I like to think he had it with him in that prison camp and that he did actually read it. I think it must have brought him comfort. I hang on to that hope. I didn't know him as a child. She adds, but I've really got to know him through his possessions, including his Bible. Five years ago, Barbara visited Le Cateau in France, where Alfred fought before he was captured. It was very emotional, she says. I realized that he had suffered so much to give me freedom. Hallelujah. Ethan? Okay, so. Thank you. Okay, so let's turn to a couple of passages. The first I want to turn to is 2 Samuel chapter 10. Because here we find the history of the Ammonites and why there was such conflict between the Ammonites and the house of Israel. So in 2 Samuel chapter 10, we find it happened after this that the king of the people of Ammon died and Hanan, his son, reigned in his place. So what had happened? King of Ammon died. And who took over? His son, Hanan. Then David said, I will show kindness to Hanan, the son of Nahash, as his father showed kindness to me. So David sent by the hand of his servants to comfort him concerning his father. And David's servants came into the land of the people of Ammon. And the princes of the people of Ammon said to Hanan, their Lord, do you think uh, that David really honors your father because he has sent comforters to you? Hmm. Has David not rather sent his servants to you to search the city, to spy it out and to throw overthrow it? Therefore, 
Hanan took David's servants, shaved off half their beards, cut off their garments in the middle at their buttocks, and sent them away. When they told David, he sent to meet them, because the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, wait at Jericho until your beards have grown, then return. When the people of Ammon saw that they had made themselves repulsive to David, the people of Ammon sent and hired the Syrians of Beth Rehob and the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 foot soldiers, and from the king of Makkah, 1,000 men, and from Ishtob, 12,000 men. Now when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all of the army of the mighty men. Then the people of Ammon came out and put themselves in battle array at the entrance of the gate. And the Syrians of Zobah, Beth, Rehob, Ishtob, and Makkah were by themselves in the field. When Joab saw that the battle line was against him, before and behind, he chose some of Israel's best and put them in battle array against the Syrians. And the rest of the people he put under the command of Abishai, his brother, that he might set them in battle array against the people of Ammon. Then he said, if the Syrians are too strong for me, then you shall help me. But if the people of Ammon are too strong for you, then I will come and help you. Be of good courage and let us be strong for our people and for the cities of our God. And may the Lord do what is good in his sight. Now, we're going to carry on with that. But I was sharing to you some of the stories of of privates and and, um, lieutenants and people like that in in the army that were either captured, killed, wounded for our freedom, and those who even fought and made it alive. Armistice happened at 11 a.m., on the 11th of November. It was the time when the battle ceased. It was called the end, the end of the world, of the the world war. Can you imagine that? The 11th of the 11th at 11 a.m. Sometimes I feel that we don't know that we're in a war. And we need to know our season. We need to know our season that we are in a war and that we ought to be where the battle is. Hallelujah. So now, I love this verse that Joab says. And I'm just going to get my notes up. I was going to print it today. uh, But unfortunately, um, you know, my printer... Um, is giving out these horrible error messages. I know, can you believe it? Awful, really. So I'm just going to get my sermon up on my phone. This is what Joab says to Abishai, his brother. So there's the Ammonites, and then there's the Syrians, Okay, the Ammonites and the Syrians. Okay, kids, Ammonites and the Syrians. So there are two things. So the Ammonites, okay, what happened was the king Ammon, the king of Ammon died. Okay, and that king was an associate of David. David really liked him. So he wanted to honor him and he sent servants along. Okay, I will show kindness. Because he showed me kindness. So David sent, by the hand of his servants, comfort. But do you know what the princes of the people of Ammon said to Hanan, the new ruler? He said, do you really think that David is honoring you now by sending his servants with comfort and care? I don't think so. I think he sent them to spy out the city because we are now weak. Okay, we, we've got a new king, you know, who's, who's, who's not experienced, you know, and, 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 you know, your dad's died and, you know, and all of this hearsay. But it wasn't true. David was literally showing kindness, but they didn't believe. And so what they did was, so Hanan took the words of the princes of his people 
And what he did was he treated the servants of David really badly. He shaved off their beard, which is like a war. No, no. Do you know what I mean? It's like you do not touch someone's beard. He, they shaved off their, they, he cut off half their beard, shaved off half their beard. Now, basically, you know, you, you, it's like saying, it's like saying, I'm going to show people that you've been abused, like, you know, that you've been, you know, taken um, vengeance against. And they cut off half the beard. And they even cut off their garments in the middle at their buttocks. That means they went around with half a beard and their bottoms on show, okay? That is not how you treat a king's servants. A king who was literally showing kindness, that is asking for war. That is like saying, come on, come on, come on, smack me now. Hit me now, come on, take me on now. Yes, this is a big message. Don't mess. Okay? And David was absolutely repulsed by the Ammonites. Absolutely repulsed. He couldn't believe it. And so, when they knew that David was repulsed, the Ammonites hired the Syrians. How Weird is this, okay? So they hired soldiers to fight their wars. Can you believe it? They hired alliances. So here it is. The Ammonites, what they knew they couldn't take David on, okay? They, they knew it, okay? So they started to prepare, okay? So here is warfare. I don't know much about warfare. I, I mean, I don't know what much about real life warfare like in in the world i mean i've never been a private or a lieutenant you know i've never been in the army the navy um that you know or the air force um so here it is a very good idea of warfare okay so first of all there is preparing the ranks okay so first when you're in a war right what do you do okay what do you do you look at your resources right okay so you're looking at your resources and you're thinking okay i'm tallying up how many soldiers do i have right to fight this army okay to fight this i mean to fight this war right to fight my enemies and and you're sort of doing this calculation you're doing an audit okay you're you're doing a weightiness of like okay how much how much can we take you know this covid right for example the situation with covid you know you're looking at your resources you're looking at the nhs you're looking at the economy and you're you're you know as the as as the head of our state as um not um our, our state that's the queen but as the head of the the, the 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 political circle you know our prime minister has got to think of the nation and think how much can can the united kingdom take uh, of this of this COVID situation. You know, where do I find the balance between uh, balancing economy and balancing the life and the, 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 the soul and the spirit of the nation, the, the people and their, and their well-being? And how do I then manage, um, you know, the, 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 you know the, the care that people would need to have if they contract COVID, right? So you're looking at medical services okay you're looking at testing facilities you're looking at um uh you know uh sort of uh, vaccines and, and cures right so you're looking at you know um first of all testing and then uh, then you know uh care uh, and then you're looking at cure so you know you're, you're balancing all of these things and so you know here is here is uh the the king of ammon who is now hanun okay Hanun was the, the, the son of um, Nahash, okay? And Hanun, okay, he has really repulsed David. He has mega repulsed David, okay? All right? Because David sent servants, and he sent them back half-bearded and half-clothed. Not good. That is not good, okay? Now, it's a shame. It's like a complete shame. Okay, it's like a slap in your face. Okay, and that's what that's what Ammon did. I mean, the, the the king of Ammon did. So now, what's happening is, 
he knows David is absolutely peeved, cheesed off, you know, completely like what just happened, you know? And so what is happening is now he's looking at the ranks because he knows he's just started a war. He's just started a war, okay? So when you start a war, <laughs> you may not start a war, but you may find that you're in a war. But when you are about to face a war, okay, this is what you do. You look at your resources. You look at your resources. And if there's a shortcoming on tools or skills or ammunition or uh, artillery or manpower or um, vehicles, okay, then you start to make sure that all those gaps are filled. Okay, so immediately Hanan buys and hires Syrians, Syrians of Beth Rahob and Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 foot soldiers, and from the king of Makkah, 1,000 men, and from Ishtob, 12,000 men. So, you know. He's really built up, okay, uh, um, an arsenal of men. Now, David heard about this. Okay, not only is David cheesed off by what's just happened to his servants that he sent to comfort, to say, look, you're not alone in this world. You, I am a king as well, and I, I've got your back. And instead of that, he took it the wrong way. Hanan took it the wrong way because of bad advice. Okay, and hearsay, okay? And uh, so we need to be careful, right? We need to be careful, okay? Don't, don't choose battles that you don't want to get into, honestly. Do not get into battles that you just don't need to get into, all right? Now, that's because sometimes when things happen, we put a twist on it, okay? We think of it differently. We say, no, you know, that servant... Okay, no, he's come to spy out my land. He's come to see, you know, uh, where my weaknesses are so that they can take me. It, you know, the, just really be careful because, you know, the way that we interpret people's looks or people's feelings or what they say to us and things like that, you know, um, it, it can start a war. It can start a battle, okay? And we don't want to get into that. We do not... But if we find ourselves in a war, this is what happens. We need to look at our artillery. And when we're in a spiritual war, friends, we need to look at our weapons and how well versed we are. We need to look at our prayer language. We need to look at um, the verses that we're declaring and decreeing in the atmosphere. We're, we need to look at who are we deploying Okay, are we saying, Lord God, deploy your angels? Are we saying that? We got, we, we, you know, we need to look at the way that we're speaking and our attitude. We need to look at um, the, having the words in and out of season on our lips. We need to look at our weapon, which is praise. We need to be well versed in our artillery when we're in war. We need to look at our fellowship because iron sharpens iron. We have got so much, so many arrows uh, to, to our, so many strings to our bow, right? So we've got prayer. We've got the language of prayer. We've got intercession. We've got worship. Okay, we've got fasting. Okay, we've got seeking the Lord for a revelation. We've got his word that we can declare and decree, okay? We can stand on his promises because his words will never fade away and his word will never come back void. Hallelujah. And it's a light unto our path, okay? So, so we, we, we have all of this stuff in our arsenal. We've got fellowship. We've got the body of Christ. We're not alone, okay? So we, we have got all this that the Lord has given us and we've got identity, We've got identity. We are royalty. And we're seated in the heavenly places, hidden in Christ. And we have the blood of Jesus as our arsenal. The blood of Jesus.
blood of Jesus as our arsenal. We have the name of Jesus as our arsenal. You remember when David said to Goliath, you come with spear, but I come in the name of my Lord. So right now, let's have a look at what happens. Syrians and the Ammonites against who? Israel. Against who? Army of David. So let's have a look what happens. I mean, can it be physically possible that two armies against one army uh, could be defeated? Let's have a look. So when Joab saw that the battle line was against him, before and behind, he chose some of Israel's best and put them in battle array against the Syrians. And the rest of the people he put under the command of Abishai, his brother. What we do is we assign one person to one problem and we assign another person to another problem. When we're at war, let's evaluate the number of things that are coming to us. And we put people in charge of each of those things. I don't know much about worldly warfare, my friends. But I can take a little leaf out of this page here and how Joab, who by the way, has known never to be defeated. That's what, that's what scholars say. They have looked at all the battles that Joab went through and he was a strategist. And he was promoted uh, to, to, uh, to um, let me have a look. I wanna say the right words. Joab, the son of Zariah, was the nephew of King David and the commander of his army. After defeating the Jebusites and gaining control of Jerusalem, David appointed him as the commander of his army. And Joab was an excellent military leader as both a skilled fighter and a tactful strategist. It's a strategist. It is believed he never lost a battle and played a key role in establishing Israel as a powerful kingdom. Joab was loyal to his king and often counseled David on major decisions. So this Joab, we can take a leaf out of his his book, I think, because I think for someone who was David's right-hand man, uh, I'd like to know more about him. Joab was his nephew and Joab won control over Jerusalem for David and so because of that David appointed him commander of his army so what did he do well what he did was he looked at the fact that there were Syrians and the Ammonites the two cultures that were fighting against the Ammonites and the Syrians and he took on the Syrians because the Syrians were vast there were the Syrians of Beth Rohab and there were the Syrians of Zobah and then he put his brother Abishai in charge of the Ammonites and it says here when Joab saw that the battle line was against him before and behind what does that mean that means that before him there was an enemy line and Behind him, there was an enemy line. Friends, I don't think I've ever experienced a war like that. I mean, in the trenches, you, 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 know, you protect your borders. And so you're always looking, right? You're always looking to see from, a, a, from this way your enemy who's in front of you, right? But this time, there was, it says here um, that the enemy line was in front before him and behind him. I need to speed up because I've got lots to share. Okay, so now basically what happens is, right, I'm just gonna quickly sort this out, okay? So Joab takes on the the Syrians and he he leaves Abishai to take on the uh, Ammonites. So in our life, okay, look at the battles, look at the battles, look at the wars. Where are they coming from, okay? And then start to appoint things or people or strategy start to look at appointing you know uh 
the, the right skill for the right war. The right skill for the right enemy. Does that make sense? So, you know, so what, so what happened was, when the Syrians saw that, um, and so Joab and the people who were there with, uh, uh, and so Joab says to, to Abishai, verse 12 of uh, chapter 10, 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 12, be of good courage and let us be strong for our people, for the cities of our God, and may the Lord do what is good in his sight. When we take on a war, we need to consolidate the team. We need to consolidate the army. We need to, con we need to take on the, the management and the people uh, from the shop floor to everybody who's involved. And we need to give them a purpose. And here it is. It says, be of good courage. So what is that? That is our mission. Be of good courage and let us be strong for our people and the cities of our God. So be of good courage. That is our mission, our vision. And let us be strong for our people and for the cities of our God. And may the Lord do what is good in his sight. And that, my friends, is a beautiful speech. What we do when we war, we have to think, I need to do this. I need to be courageous. I need to be strong for my people. I need to be strong for the cities of our God. When we go out there to evangelize, we need to know that we need to be of good courage. And we need to be strong because of our people. Because for the cities of our God. There is a higher purpose. There is a higher purpose. So Joab and the people who were there with him drew near for the battle against the Syrians and they fled before him. <laughs> Amazing. So Joab, right, drew near the battle against the Syrians and they fled. They ran. It was like, <coughs> and they ran. I don't know how they run. Okay, and they fled. And guess what happened? When the people of Ammon saw that the Syrians were fleeing, they fled from Abishai and entered the city. So Joab returned from the people of Ammon and went to Jerusalem. And when the Syrians saw that they had been defeated by Israel, they gathered together. Then Hadadezer sent and brought out the Syrians who were Hadadezer's army who were beyond the river and they came to Halam and Shabak the commander of, ha of, of Hadadezer's army went before them when it was told David when he it was told David David gathered all Israel and crossed over the Jordan and came to Halam okay so let me get this right the Syrians run away as jo Joab approaches the Ammonites see this and they flee Abishai and then what happens is, now that they feel defeated, they go, right, you know, this is really bad. I mean, like, you know, uh, we, need to, we need to get more Syrians who are beyond the river, okay? So that's what, ha what, that's what happened. And when David was told that we're gathering this, he gathered all of Israel that were crossed over the Jordan and came to Halam. And the Syrians set themselves in battle array against David and fought with him. We need alliances in war. We need alliances in war. Okay? We can't war by ourselves. Okay? We need to have a network of people that pray with us, that cover us in prayer. Okay? That, that worship, that, that, that sing over us. We need people uh, in our lives that believe in us, that are there for us, okay? It's, this is a very uh, a brief moment that we live. And, and we don't want, you know, to waste that, okay? So we need people that believe in us. We need people that, that pray over us, sing over us, and are there for us to fight the battles. And here it says, David 
also gathered Israel and crossed over the Jordan and came to Halam. And the Syrians set themselves in battle array against David and fought with him. Then the Syrians fled before Israel and David killed 700 charioteers and 40,000 horsemen of the Syrians and struck Shabak the commander of their army who died there. And when all the kings who were servants to Hadadzer saw that they were defeated by Israel, they made peace with Israel and served them. So the Syrians were afraid to help the people of Ammon anymore. Verse, uh, chapter 11. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. So finally, because the Ammonites lost their allegiance and their support from the Syrians who halted helping them anymore, Joab and his servants were able to destroy the people of Ammon and they took over Rabbah. But David stayed behind at Jerusalem. Uh-oh, uh-oh. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle. Because what happens in the winter is that, you know, you, you, you thicken up, you start to eat, you, 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 you know, you get, get your flesh on, you, you hibernate, don't you, in the, in, the, in the winter. And then when the spring comes, oh, you know what? We're prepared, we're ready, we're fed, we're rested, we're going to go to war. So in the spring of the year, when kings go out to battle, David remained at Jerusalem. David remained at Jerusalem. Beloved, it is the time. I don't know whether you know it or not. It is a season of war in the circle of politics, in the circle of family, in the circle of education, in the circle of health and care. Every circle that you look at, we are facing a war. And beloved, if you do not know it or not, I'm telling you now, know the season that you are in. And don't stay behind. And David remained. It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle. David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, um, Is this not Bathsheba, uh, the daughter of Eliam, uh, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity. And she returned to her house. And the woman conceived. So she sent and told David and said, I am with child. Then David sent Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was and how the people were doing and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house and gift of food from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his wife. So David dismissed him, right, from his duties and said, look, Uriah, look, just go home, get washed up, get fed, get you know, connect with your family. But he didn't do that. He just slept at the king's house. He slept at the door of the king's house. That's how, um, you know, that, that's how uh, loyal he was to David. And, but Uriah slept at the, and uh, then uh, and David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house, and the gift of food followed. But Uriah slept at the door of his king's house with all the servants of his lord, and did not go down to his house. So when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, 
did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? You know, reminding me of that journey, I, I'm reminded of what uh, Johnny said last week. You know, the, 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 the more difficult your journey, you know, the greater the result, the greater your calling, right? So did you not come from, your, from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. So what he's saying is, um, uh, your majesty, the ark, Israel, Judah, dwelling in tents. My lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing, says Uriah. Then David said to Uriah, wait here today also and tomorrow. I will let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now, when David called him, he ate and drank before him and he made him drunk. And at evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house again. In the morning it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him, that he may be struck down and die. So it was, while Joab besieged the city, that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there were valiant men. Then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the people of the servants of David fell. The Uriah and Uriah the Hittite died also. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war. And later on it, it goes on and says, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. When we're in a battle, okay, yes, we need to appoint our skills for certain warfare, for certain enemies that are striking. Okay, we need to use our certain skills for that. But we need to get behind it, okay? We don't just delegate and stay behind because what will happen is we will get distracted with other things, okay? When we're in a war, let's not get distracted because that leads to sin. That leads to, um, uh, you know, uh, sort of... Um, evil even i mean you know he not only commits adultery okay but he also murders the the husband uriah the hittite okay and you know it's just terrible what happens and all he had to do was in the springtime when kings went out to battle david went out to end of story but it didn't happen that way Friends, we are in a war, beloved. And we need to know what to do. So in a war, you know, you have frontline people. So Uriah was put in the front lines of war. You know, when you're put in the front line, you're, you're the first defense. You're the first defense, like, like Reuben was saying. You know, I love what he used, the word call to duty, you know. I, I love that, a call to duty, right? So you, 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 you enlist and you're called to duty and you're front line. That means uh, it's very, very, very unlikely that you will survive. Very unlikely. If you're front line, you know this is probably going to be your last days. Okay, because, you know, when you're in the front line, okay, you are... The, 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 the first defense. You're the first defense. And so Uriah was placed there. You know what our first defense is? Is our faith in Jesus. That is our first defense. Our faith in Jesus and the power of his blood. 
that is our shield. You see, the, you know, some, have you heard of the human shield, like in warfare? So what they do is, say for example, um, there's, you know, fire, enemy fire going on. And they want to stop the fire, the, 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 the bullets, they want to stop the, the artillery going through. What they do is they take innocent civilians and they put them in a place where this heavy fire is going on. And so that is called a human shield because they know that in, in proper warfare, you know, um, you, wouldn't do, um, you wouldn't do acts of uh, unkindness to, to human civilians because your war is not against the civilian, your war is against an army, right? So they, they do a human shield. And, and li literally, you know, the front line can, can be like that. You know, so Uriah was put in front, and what happens? He dies, and that's what David wanted. When there is a war, we need to be on horseback and be a king and reign. We need to reign. We need to reign. Okay, one Chronicles, two one. Israel had sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. Okay, so these were the sons of Israel, Jacob, you know Jacob, the supplanter. The sons of Issachar were Issachar were Tola, Pua, Jahush, and Shimron. And then it says in one Chronicles. Wait, sorry. Let me before that. The sons of Issachar were Tola. This is one Chronicles seven one. One Chronicles seven one. The sons of Issachar were Tola, Pua, Jashub, and Shimron. Four in all. The sons of Tola were Uti, Rephiah, Jeriel, and it goes on like that. And then it says, the sons of Tola were mighty men of valor in their generations. Their number in the days of David was 22,600. The son of Uti was, Iz, was Iz, Izrahiah. And the sons of Izrahiah were Michael, Obadiah, Joel, and Ishiah. All five of them were chief men, and with them, by their generations, according to their fathers' houses, were 36,000 troops ready for war, for they had many wives and sons. So here we know that uh, a lot of preachers and a lot of teachers talk about the sons of Issachar knowing the seasons. They, they always... Uh, give you the verse, don't they? 1 Chronicles 12, 32. And of the sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times. Understanding of what? The times. To know what Israel ought to do. Their chiefs were 200 and all their brethren were at their command. So we already know, right, that Issachar, uh, the sons of Issachar, had understanding of the times, and they knew what Israel ought to do. But they never tell you, do they, that these sons of Issachar were mighty men of valor. They were mighty men of valor, okay? And they were chief men as well. They were chief men as well, 200 chiefs. Okay, and do you know what? It says here, they were experts in war with all weapons of war. How amazing is that? And do you know what? Altogether, there were 36,000 troops ready for war. So we know the times, okay? We, oh, I really know the times. I, but are you a mighty man of valor? Okay? Are you ready for the war? 
Okay, now listen to listen to this. Okay, these guys had two hundred chiefs in them. They were mighty men of valor. They had experts in war with all weapons of war. They knew what Israel ought to do. They knew they had an understanding of the times. Friends, I want to encourage us that we need to be mighty. We need to be mighty men and women of valor, and we know. Not by might, not by strength, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And we know that we need to have Holy Spirit. We need to be overflowing with Holy Spirit so that we are mighty men and women of valor. In Matthew eleven twelve fourteen. 14. It says, Jesus says, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John and you are willing to receive it. He is Elijah who is come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So this is the, the part where, you know, Jesus says, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. You know what um, Hannah read today, Isaiah 62. It says, I have set wet watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent and give him no rest till he establishes, until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. And I love it where it says, in verse 10, this is all action. Verse 10, go through, go through the gates, prepare the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, take out the stones, lift up a banner for the peoples. Indeed, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the world, say to the daughter of Zion, surely your salvation is coming. Behold, his reward is with him, his work before him, and they shall call them the holy people the redeemed of the lord and you shall be called sought out a city not forsaken if you did not know if you did not know the purpose is this till he makes jerusalem a praise on the earth he has set watchmen on the walls and they will never hold their peace day or night they who make mention of the lord will not keep silent. Friends, if you didn't know, this is what's happening. Until the Lord makes Jerusalem a praise on the earth, he has set watchmen on the walls. He has set us on the walls. Listen to this. I don't know about much of worldly warfare, but I do know this, that in warfare, you have watchmen. So what it is, is you have like these big, huge towers, Okay, uh, or you have these like big, huge, like you know, um, like uh, uh, you know, viewpoints. Okay, where you can see for miles. All right, so that you're not completely shocked when when someone comes. You know, uh, of invading your borders because you have kept a guard over it. That's why we need watchmen over our city. Do you understand? We need watchmen over our, our cities. Okay? So we need watchmen. It says, why, why do we need watchmen? Because until he makes Jerusalem a praise on the earth, there will be enemies. And they will never hold their peace day or night. This is spiritual warfare. Day or night. If you did not know that you are in a warfare, this is plain to see and read. Isaiah 62. And it says here, The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by the arm of his strength, surely I will no longer give you grain as food for your enemies, and the sons of the foreigners shall not drink your new wine for which you have labored. 
for those who have gathered it shall eat it. Those who have gathered it shall eat it. Get into the harvest. Get into gathering it and then get into eating it. Those who have brought it together shall drink it in my holy courts. I love this action. Go through, go through the gates, prepare the way for the people. Remember what Joab said to his brother, Abishai? He said, be of good courage. Be strong for our people. We need to be strong for the souls on our watch. We need to be strong for that. We need to be strong for that. You know, even Jesus had zeal. One day, he was in the temple. And the pastor of the, of the Jews was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen, sheep, and doves, and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changes of money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Zeal for your house has eaten me up. And where is that from? That's from Psalm 69, verse 9. Because zeal for your house has eaten me up. And the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. We need to have zeal for our house. For the house of God. For the churches. We need to have zeal. Okay, we need to cleanse the temple. We need to cleanse the temple. Finally, in 2 Timothy 4, Paul says this as his final words. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. We are in a war and we need to declare the word because the truth will set the people free. We need to declare the word. It says, preach the word. This is for me, just as it is for you. This is for me as well. Preach the word. Be ready. In season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers that they, that they will turn their ears away from the truth and be, turn, and be turned aside to fables. That's fake things, that's myths. But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And then he says, and we, we put this, don't we? We put this in my mother-in-law's um, Bible reading uh, for the, the crematorium service. 2 Timothy, verse 6. For I am already poured out, Paul writes, as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Friends, I want people to know at the end of my days that I fought the good fight. We need to know the season that we're in. And we need to appoint a front line 
We need to appoint an attack and a defense. We need to get our tools sharpened for warfare. We need to change our prayer language. We need to know that we stand victorious in the blood of Jesus. We are not defeated. And we need to say, I will fight the good fight. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And Father, on this Remembrance Sunday, where we hear of wars and where we hear stories of overcoming and stories of victory, stories of strategy and stories of loss for freedom. We thank you, God, that we are never alone, that you are always with us and you are not against us, for you are for us. And so, Father, we go in your love, in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Guys, be blessed. We thank you for joining us this morning. And we really urge you in this time to know the seasons. Like the sons of Issachar, you know what? They were mighty men of valor. And that's what we need to be, mighty men and women of valor. And we need to know that we are watchmen on the walls because until Jerusalem is set as a praise on the earth, we will continue. We will not rest. We will not rest day or night. And I tell you now, at the end is waiting for you the crown of righteousness because you have fought the good fight. Thank you, saints.